uh, okay. This portion of this meeting is being recorded. After, uh, when we get into the open mic session, we will uh, not be recorded and we will be uh, just, uh, we will be there uh, and uh, live and able to uh, make errors or rough draft or whatever. And uh, I do encourage you to use the chat function to let your uh, comments be known to whichever poet is presenting at a given time. We want to offer that kind of support. So with uh, a number of us here tonight, I think that uh, it would probably be good if, if we did mute when you're not speaking, uh, just because it uh, cuts off dark, barking dogs and feedback and all those kinds of things. <laughs> So I, it is my pleasure to introduce to you tonight uh, Louise Moises, whom many of you know and are here to support. <laughs> and yeah, let's, let's just give a round of applause. Uh, now, Louise sent me a bio, which is always good. And so I know, you, Louise, that you are a native of the Bay Area and that you graduated from San Jose State and that you have had an, an amazing number of uh, occupations in your lifetime, a teacher, a storyteller, a puppeteer, a retail clerk, and the owner of an antiquarian bookstore. And that you now enjoy traveling with your cat in your 23 foot RV, exploring out of the way places. And you have received many awards and recognitions for your poetry from the Ina Kulbra Circle and Artists Embassy International and Soul Making. And you've been published in a number of online venues and printed anthologies. And that you also enjoy reading, gardening, dancing, and singing. But the thing that most captivated me about your bio was this last line that according to you, every day is a new adventure. And that captivated me because that's what I've heard in your poems, that yeah. sense of adventurousness. Uh, do you want to say something about adventure and poetry? <laughs> uh, I find in uh, poetry that the adventure is everywhere. Uh, I, I write a lot about looking out my window my office window looks out onto a marvelous tree, and there's always some kind of adventure going on. If I'm not involved, I'm the witness to the adventure. So, and my dancer, my dance friends lead me into new poetry adventures, and my family. So, as every door is kind of an opening. Okay. Well, that is good. Now, when did you start writing? How did you start writing? Well, um, I wrote off and on kind of for my whole life, but never formally, never revising and until I was widowed for the second time four years ago and had time on my hands that I needed some way to express myself and started taking creative writing classes, which started with short story. And then under the influence of Evie Grock, who's here tonight, yes. she said, send one of your poems to the Ina Kulberth contest. And lo and behold, the first poem that I sent won a second place in the humor division. So I was hooked. And um, Evie has encouraged me over the last four years of our friendship to continue to write on a regular basis. Absolutely. So it's a, it's a means for me to express problems sometimes or joy and especially grief mm -hmm. and um, I've worked a lot of my poems involve the exploration of grief right. and, and that really was kind of a, a spark to your beginning to write are there situations or times when you just can't write uh, I haven't come up with that yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I Congratulations. Feel, and, and I don't. I don't ever feel like I. I'm not regimented. So I write every day whenever I feel like it. Sometimes okay. I'm outside. Sometimes I'm in the house. Sometimes I'm in bed. Mm -hmm. So I have paper and pens everywhere. Okay. 
<laughs> so however it comes to you. Right. Marvelous. All right. Well, this we do this little interview just to give uh, all of us some context for understanding the uh, the poet and her production of her poems. I'd like to just turn it over to you now, Louise, to make your presentation for the evening. Thank Take you. Take us on an adventure. Well, this is one an adventure the first time that I have been a feature reader since I was in college, which was a long time ago. <laughs> so this, I want to thank Mary Guest for asking me, and I'm really honored that uh, you have included me in the circle of most wonderful poets who have read here over the years. Um, Mary Susan suggested a theme for the evening, which was coincidence. So I looked through my poems trying to find one that related to that theme. And on January 27th, 2020, I happened to be sitting in my, on my back deck on one of those warm California Januaries and a large helicopter went over and it was a sad coincidence. And I wrote this poem entitled the helicopter for Kobe and the eight others. Battering blades beat a rhythm against the sky, interrupting the peaceful lull of my morning, thumping against my chest in time with my heartbeat. Yesterday, they died, all nine. Blades hitting the earth in a fiery crash, they ended their time a heap of ash. Did they know in those last seconds of life it would be their final flight? For Kobe and his friends. And this is a happier look at the sky. My father flew in blimps. In World War II, my father flew in blimps, great gray whales of the air that floated on a hum of small engines. Dipping above the house where my mother lived before she was my mother and he my father. On the porch, she waved to him wildly, shouting her love at the sky and in her innocence believed that he could hear her as the blimp teetered above the house. Moonlight. Through the porthole in the steerage portion of the ship, seasick from the motion and confinement, my Italian grandmother must have seen the moonlight reflected on the waves. Walking down the gangplank onto Ellis Island, timid and frightened in the new land. Perhaps she experienced the round-faced moon creating dazzling diamonds on the crown of the lady. On the ferry to the mainland, on across the country, anxious to join her young husband. She must have watched the phases of the moon through the train window how the crescent balanced on the tip of the Rocky Mountains, how it set behind the Sierras, and finally showed its face on the San Francisco Bay. I never met my grandmother. She and her young husband, my grandfather, died in the flu epidemic of 1918. I can only imagine what she saw and the good life she had anticipated. A lot of my poems are about my family and I think a lot of poets do mine their work from their family and their kind of memoir poems. This is entitled Hint of Mortality. When I was 12, I stood in awe, watched my father swing the ax. The old tree cracked, 
crashed to the ground, brittle branches shot through the air, snapped, threatened to impale. The th trunk bounced once, settled in a cloud of dust, denting the earth. Two empty nests rolled across summer's lush lawn, disturbed a cloud of camouflaged grasshoppers. The scent of sawdust filled the air as my father's noisy saw cut lengths for winter's warmth. Next to the house, I stacked the heavy limbs, what was left of the noble tree, a neat pile of logs. Now, this is a rather um, long poem, but um, usually I write things that fit on one page especially because Submittable likes you to have poems that are like 40 lines in length. This is slightly longer because it tells a rather long and I think intriguing story. Dad's pickup truck. Red pickup truck, paint faded by the sun, weathered by years of use, eroded like the old roads it once traveled, bumps and dents and spots of rust, two flat tires, missing parts, engine, long silent, resting at the old ranch in the field beside the decaying barn, waiting for the man with swollen legs, back bent from years of work. The man tells Polito, his caregiver, ranch stories, collecting eggs, milking cows, mucking out stalls, slaughtering pigs, making sausages, no electricity, outdoor plumbing. Polito listens patiently as he massages the old man's swollen feet. Yes, Polito, I left that life at 19, never went back. Now when it's too damn late, I wish I had. The old man's head sinks back onto his recliner and he dreams. His daughter visits once a week. She kisses his forehead. Oh, hi, sweetheart. He squeezes her hand, his grip still strong. He has a story on his mind. When I was 10, he says, I learned to drive. Trusted to take the lunches to the ranch hands working in the field. Truck I learned on, shiny red, almost new. A Ford, you know. Never driven anything but a Ford my whole life. My mother died at 53. Cancer of the womb, you know. Why do you suppose I'm living so goddamn long? His daughter touches his knee. Yep, he nods, that pickup truck had a big, strong V8 engine. Had to in order to take those rough dirt roads, bounding over ruts, pulling up hills, jackrabbits scattering before the wheels, pheasants flying. He laughs at the memory, eyes focused on the past. Harvest time, everyone worked at harvest time, even the kids. My younger brother, Gordon, rode with me holding on to the lunches. He died of lung cancer when he was 64. Why the hell you think I'm living so goddamn long? His daughter shakes her head, not knowing how to answer. Ah, at harvest time, there was barley to mow, big old combine pulled into the field by mules, Lunchtime, the workers rested in the shade of that machine, staring up the road, waiting to see that red pickup appear out of a cloud of dust. Me, barely able to see over the dash. But I was big for my age. I always have been a big guy. This morning, I weighed 240, lost four pounds. That old ranch was acres of hard work. But those were good times when we were young. That Ford pickup and me. He runs his hands over his face, wiping the sweat of the harvest from his brow. Exhausted from his labors, he leans his head back and closes his eyes. 
I wonder what became of that old truck, he says. And why the hell you think I'm living so goddamn long? Wow. <laughs> Um, so people who know me personally know that I have been widowed twice. So this is dedicated to my first husband, Henry Moises. My husband, the physicist, read science books in bed. Heavy tomes, dark blue cloth, underlining the words with a fat yellow felt pen. One night when I couldn't sleep, Max Planck's treatise on thermodynamics rested on my husband's chest. I asked him to read to me. Soon my eyes grew heavy. Drifting off to sleep, I dreamt of thermodynamics. Explosive sounds, great chunks of matter coming apart, masses of meteors breaking through the Van Allen belts, renting the atmosphere with heat and energy powerful enough to crack the shell of the earth. When my husband died, I gave away his scientific books, too complex for me to comprehend. Still, the first law of thermodynamics wanders through my subconscious. What can't be created or destroyed? Conservation of energy, a conundrum of confusion for my non-scientific mind. Last year, I visited the meteorite crater in Arizona, over 4,000 feet in diameter. Standing on the brink, I tried to envision the impact the explosion, the execution of the conservation of energy. I imagined my husband's voice echoing around the hole in the ground, bouncing off the red rock walls. I daydreamed of thermodynamics, an exchange of heat and work, the conservation of energy. And this one is dedicated to my second husband, Brian Paul Don Levy, who died in 2017 and motivated me to write poetry. The Stone. Hiking near an icy stream, he bent, splashed at the water's edge, fumbled with something. Then he joined me on the bridge, opening his damp hand a cream-colored, almost translucent stone, edges smooth to an egg shape from constant rolling. For you, he said, the stone, the stream, we two standing on the bridge, no other words, only the stone passing from his hand mine. So I write a lot in free verse, as you can tell. So this one is one of my rhymed poems that I actually wrote in 2017 as sort of a uh, memorial to something that had passed. It's called uh, Flamenco on the Bar. He lined up shots of Jameson on the glossy varnish bar, wrapped his arms around me, whispered, you are my star. Tonight, my sweet, he said, we'll make love on the back seat of my car. And Philip, in his fancy stoop, strim, strummed his classical guitar. The night I danced flamenco on the bar. Mm. My husband, ordered drinks for all the bright young men. They were half his age, and then he flirted with all their dressed up women friends, and Philip sat among the bright magenta stars. Tonight I dance flamenco on the bar. 
Joe filled orders from the crowd above the voices roaring loud and took in tips and sponged up drips while Philip thrummed his shiny brown guitar the night I danced flamenco on the bar. The atmosphere was joyful. There were no tears in sight, with neon beer lines blinking with an artificial light. I sipped my wine and sang with all my might, and the lights glowed on Philip's bass guitar. The night I danced flamenco on the bar. Step up, the young gal said as she offered me her hand. You must join us up here on the bar. There's plenty of room to stand. They formed a circle round me, watched my heels pound on the bar as Philip increased the tempo on his classical guitar. The night I danced flamenco on the bar. The young man clapped. The gals all roared, my husband loudly yelled for more, as I spun and tapped and laughed with glee, for all the folks were watching me. As Philip stood and strummed this elegant guitar, the night I danced flamenco on the bar. The bar closed down last year, I'm told, for Philip and Jill were growing old. There's only memories floating there in an empty old magician, musician's chair where Philip sat and cradled his elegant guitar the night I danced flamenco on the bar. Ole. Ole. Omen. The day after I scattered your ashes beneath our thorny rose bushes, an osprey circled the house, your favorite bird, never before or since. I took it as a sign, you watching over me as you always did with your wide outspread wings. Now I'd like to take you on a journey in my RV, my class C RV, its name is uh, Bigfoot. This is called driving alone on the high desert road. I am alone on the twisting, winding road, window down, heat of high desert air wraps around me like a suffocating shawl. Brief afternoon storm sizzles on the pavement. I catch the pungent fragrance of rain dampened sage. Hot winds whip and whirl around sandstone, millennium of sculpting curvaceous bodies out of solid rock. Awestruck, I drive through narrow canyons. Before me, silhouetted mountains waver behind veils of dusty haze. Sun, unmitigated blazing sun, crushes the landscape. No creatures walk or stalk or perch beside the road. Only rock rabbits and bush bears. Broken fence posts support rusted barbed wire. No birds call. The only sound, the hum of my wheels on asphalt. No one passes. I am alone when suddenly a circling shadow crosses the road. I pull over, stop, exit, look skyward. A singular vulture circles, outstretched black wings, fingers of feathers. The huge bird rocks and glides, head peering down, searching. Then caught on a thermal and invisible heat of air, the vulture rises above the sandstone cliffs, soars higher and higher, 
an ink spot on a passing cloud. Finally, the bird disappears altogether. The cloud dissipates, leaving an empty sky. And once more, I am alone. How's my time? Okay. It's, it's going well. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is another inspiration uh, from parking at a natural spring out in uh, Bureau of Land Management land in Utah. This is called Arroyos. In this parched Utah landscape, horses travel in arroyos. On silent hoofs move towards water. A sturdy white mare guides her foal, and the rest of her herd follows. On sure legs, they run towards the spring. I have hidden my love for you in a deep arroyo, when I should have sent it running with the horses. Too cautious to give my heart, too fearful for another loss. Before you came, my landscape parched and arid, like the land of central Utah. You guided me towards sustaining springs. Together we watched the horses drink, then followed them as they disappeared into the arroyos. They left only dust rising above the desert ditches. The sun vanished behind the rolling hills. The stars reflected their faces in the spring. Somewhere beyond the arroyos, the horses hid in protective herds, slept standing up as horses do, while you and I lay beneath the midnight sky in the quiet arroyos of each other's arms. I dreamt of horses at the spring yielded to the icy water and drank in your love. Thank you so much. I have a couple of poems from the pandemic and then I'll round it up. <laughs> uh, over this past now 69th week, the Pinole Writers Group met once a week, gave each other prompts, shared poetry. So um, a number of these came from the inspiration from those wonderful writers. This is entitled, At the Playground. My two-year-old grandson stands outside the locked playground, shaking the gate, banging the metal against metal, he tries to squeeze between the rungs. How do you explain to a two-year-old why the swings are still, the slide vacant? A blue ball rests on the asphalt, no one there to kick. Voices of children silenced in the isolation, playground closed. I look down at him over my mask hold out my gloved hand and guide him towards home. Uh, this is one of my pandemic poems that was accepted and is in an anthology at the produce market before. Handsome round faced man in his seventies rolls a pale globe of a nectarine around in his hands, lifts the fruit to his nose and inhales. He looks at me, soft accented voice. These are so sweet, he says, like someone sprinkle them with honey. He hands me the fruit. I smile, place the nectarine carefully in my basket not wanting to bruise the gift. After, gloved hands pick fruit without testing. Signs posted, only touch what you will buy. Masked shoppers hide smiles, 
avoid eye contact, keep at a distance, move in paranoid fear. No one inhales the fragrance of the fruit. No one shares a nectarine. And um, this is one I wrote yesterday. So we've gone from the dancing flamenco on the bar, which is an oldie, to yesterday's. Clinging vines. Every day I work at digging up the roots of the invasive green briar, commonly known as Simlax. Its curling vines threaten to overwhelm my box elder hedge. The tendrils strangle all they encounter. Below ground, massive knobby rhizomes, when broken off, quickly regenerate. I must be vigilant, vigilant to shovel deeply, pull out the rooted offenders. Over the last year, I have removed hundreds and still I find more. Much like the racism that lodges deep within our soil. And I will, my time about up? Yeah, about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, maybe I'll give you one more because I just love writing this poem. Uh, this is for my river rafting son, my son, the oarsman. My son in his 53rd year, broad of shoulder and chest, powerful arms, tanned legs braced against the rubber blue of the raft, gloved hands gripping the long oars, dipping their tips into the icy snowmelt of the upper Arkansas, guiding us into the swirl of the river, downstream through the surge of sounds into the tunneled rocks of Brown's Canyon past the decaying railroad bridge, propelled by the forces of gravity to descend in waves of clarity. Red rocks pinned against the sky, water washed over boulders, creating rushing, rapid, spinning, dipping, diving. Behind us, the snow-capped Rockies, before a whirl of water. My son reads the river pulling on the oars, thrusting us into the raging staircase, through the flumes, past the rocky lions resting on the banks, the prolific sandstone figures of ancients, expertly into holes around the bends, the thrill of water crashing over the bow, where I sit white knuckled, holding the straps of survival. My son, the oarsman, his mouth wide with laughter, booming in unison with the roar of the river. My son, the oarsman, shares the precious gift of the river, the freedom of abandoning the land. Our world is in the moment, the now of the rapids. My ears echo with my own screams peering down into a hole in the river. I see my fear and the water washes over the raft and over me. Oh, at the end of the run, my son's voice. I'm proud of you, mom. And this will be my farewell. River reverie. Sitting on the bank of the river, I contemplate the times of my life, each ripple, each whirlpool, the rise, the fall, the calm along the shore. The river and my days flow by Impossible to catch a sunbeam glimmering on the water, here and gone before I passed my line. Some days, my life like the river moves downstream faster than I wish. 
Some days I am caught in an eddy, unable to move. At times I am in a rush of rapids, fighting to keep from drowning over rocks, through nooks and crannies, sometimes being slammed against an obstacle with such force, I fear it is my end. But the swift current grabs me, pushing me ever onward. The good, the bad, the joys, the sorrows, a magnificent complexity of river I relinquish myself to the power of motion. My life, a microcosm, a fast surge flowing onward to the sea. Thank you. Thank you. So many adventures and you've taken us on, to, on the river, on the ocean, in the arroyos, uh, mystical osprey. Uh, just so replete with images and dance and grief all along together. Really appreciate this. Thank you, Louise. Thank you for having me. Thank you to my audience. <laughs> all right, we're, go we're going to go into our open mic.